Of the 45 men to serve as United States president, 23 have been single-term presidents. Of these 23, four were single-term by choice. Other presidents have served a full single term and one partial term, but declined to seek a second full term. The first president to pledge to serve only a single term was William Henry Harrison, the ninth president. Three previous presidents had only served a single term, but all of them had tried to get reelected and had simply failed. Harrison's pledge was part of the Whig Party's platform at the time. They believed in limiting the power of the presidency, or the executive branch, and placing as much power as possible in the legislative branch. Part of this agenda was a single-term rule. Like many other Whig policies, it was partially a reaction to the Andrew Jackson presidency, a two-term presidency in which the Whigs accused Jackson of reigning with tyrannical power. In his inaugural address, Harrison called the allowance of a two-term presidency to be a defect in the Constitution, saying that such a long time in office would lead to the corruption and destruction of even individuals with noble intent, let alone those lovers of power, as he called them. He said it could make a president forget that he is, quote, the servant, not the master. He thus proposed the Constitution be amended and said, quote, I give my aid to it by renewing the pledge heretofore given that under no circumstance will I consent to serve a second term. Harrison's word was, however, never tested as he died in office after only 30 days. His vice president, John Tyler, ascended to the presidency. Tyler broke with the Whigs on so many major issues that he was expelled from the party, so it might be no surprise that he didn't go along with the one-term rule either, and ran in the election of 1844, though unsuccessfully. He was then succeeded by James K. Polk, who was the next president to pledge to only serve a single term, and the president most famous for making the pledge. He's considered one of the nation's most successful presidents, not only among single-term presidents, but among all presidents. In just four years, he achieved all of his campaign promises and left office with popular support. Ironically, Polk wasn't part of the party that promoted single-term presidencies. He was not only a Democrat, but also a protege of Andrew Jackson, the man who made the Whigs detest two-term presidencies. Some attribute Polk's single-term pledge to practicality, so that he could dedicate all his energy to achieving all of his goals without being encumbered by the always time-consuming matter of re-election. Others say that it was the wider influence of the Whigs. The idea of a one-term limit, while having originated with the Whigs, had caught on more broadly. Polk's Whig election rival, Henry Clay, was pushing harder than ever for the single-term constitutional amendment, by promising to serve only a single term, Polk was taking away Clay's thunder. Perhaps the main reason, however, was in dealing with his Democratic rivals. In 1844, the Democrats were being divided along factional lines. Older and more powerful figures, such as Lewis Cass, Martin Van Buren, and Richard Mentor Johnson, had all desired the Democratic nomination, but because of their infighting, not one of them was able to acquire the needed two-thirds majority. Seemingly, out of nowhere, Polk emerged as a compromise candidate. However, the bitter rivals all still had their eyes on the presidency. In promising to only serve a single term, Polk was assuring the others that in four years, rather than eight, they'd have their chance at the presidency, thus securing their support in the general election. Polk served out a full term, and despite his popularity, he kept to his pledge and didn't run for renomination. Polk died only three months after leaving office, so it's likely that even if he ran for and won a second term, he wouldn't have served much of it. One of the hopefuls for the 1844 Democratic nomination, James Buchanan, got his own presidential term in 1856. He was the third president to pledge not to run again. 
While it's often said that he didn't run due to his massive unpopularity by the end of his term, he'd made the pledge to be a one-term president as early as his inaugural address. It's not clear why Buchanan pledged to only serve one term, but it's possible his age was a factor. He desired the presidency for long over a decade, but when he finally became president, he was 65 years old. Up to that point, only one president was older when entering office, William Henry Harrison, who died only a month into his term. As such, there were rumors about Buchanan's health, though they were likely overblown, if not unfounded. Despite his age, he'd live out a full term and then live for seven more years, dying eventually at 77. But Buchanan's age wasn't the only thing that had changed since his early presidential aspirations. The nation was more divided than ever, and becoming more so day by day. Furthermore, his party was becoming divided between Northern and Southern Democrats. Buchanan may have been looking not only to leave the White House before a civil war could break out, but also to leave his party in the leadership of younger men more acquainted with the current issues of the day. There's almost no doubt that even if he had pursued a second term, he wouldn't have won it. He was largely hated by the end of his presidency, and even four years prior, when he was first nominated by the Democrats, he was merely a compromise candidate. For his part, Buchanan was more than happy to leave the presidency and the inevitable civil war in the hands of his successor. The next president to make a single-term pledge came 20 years later with Rutherford B. Hayes. He was the first Republican to do so. It's often stated that Hayes had made the pledge in the aftermath of the controversial election of 1876, in which the election had been so close that Republicans had to make concessions to the Democrats to get them to accept Hayes as president. In actuality, Hayes had made the pledge back during his acceptance speech at the Republican National Convention. Hayes wasn't fundamentally committed to presidents always serving only single terms. For him, the pledge was simply a personal choice, as he believed it would set an example in his goal of civil service reform. He believed in getting rid of the old patronage system in which elected officials used their office to benefit their allies. He stated that restoration of a merit-based civil service system, quote, can be best accomplished by an executive officer who is under no temptation to use the patronage of his office to promote his own re-election. By the end of his term, many were satisfied with his presidency, and some Republicans actually encouraged him to run for a second term. Hayes declined. He not only didn't want to betray his word, but was also satisfied with his presidency. There were four presidents who served a single term along with a partial term, but didn't seek a full second term. Theodore Roosevelt, Calvin Coolidge, Harry Truman, and Lyndon Johnson took over after the deaths of their predecessors and were later elected to full terms of their own. In the case of Roosevelt and Truman, their partial terms were nearly three years long, almost the length of a full term. Both effectively had two-term presidencies. As such, Roosevelt wanted to honor the two-term tradition and thus declined to run in 1908, though he'd later run for a non-consecutive second full term four years later. Truman declined to seek a second full term largely due to his abysmal approval ratings by the end of 1952. Calvin Coolidge and Lyndon Johnson hold a more ambiguous place in regards to labels. Both were technically two-term presidents, but they had incredibly short partial terms, Coolidge's being just 19 months and Johnson's about 14. Not only was the idea of either seeking a third term or second full term not controversial, but it was actually expected. Despite widespread popularity, Coolidge shocked the nation when he released the statement, I do not choose to run. In his autobiography, published the same year he left office, he outlined his reasons, some professional and some personal. He said he was largely satisfied with his presidency and believed a second term wouldn't go as well. 
citing how many two-term presidents end their presidency, quote, clouded with grave disappointments, a phenomenon others have observed, known as the two-term curse, where a president's second term is significantly less successful. Considering the shortness of his partial term, he didn't believe a second full term would break the long-held two-term tradition. However, he was concerned about how it would be perceived. For the sake of the American people, he didn't think it was good that a president appeared to be, quote, grasping for power. On the personal side, he wrote, quote, the presidential office takes a heavy toll on those who occupy it and those who are dear to them, and mentioned concerns about his wife's health if she had to serve 10 years as first lady. With Coolidge's reputation as a very laid-back president, some newspapers and cartoonists mocked him, saying he simply wanted a post-presidency of leisure, but Coolidge denied this. Lyndon Johnson's situation mirrored Coolidge's in that he was expected to be his party's candidate. However, he didn't share the same popularity. In 1964, Johnson won his first full term with 61% of the popular vote, the largest share of the popular vote the Democratic Party has ever won. However, the nation had turned on him due to frustration with urban riots and the Vietnam War. By the time of the Democratic primaries, Johnson was facing strong opposition from Senator Eugene McCarthy, who was boldly challenging the incumbent president. After a disappointing result in the New Hampshire Democratic primary, Johnson addressed the nation, saying that he wouldn't actively seek re-election, nor would he accept the nomination, even if it were granted to him. In the address, Johnson explained that he wanted his full attention to be focused on the nation's problems, rather than partisan battles. But there's much speculation as to his larger motivations. Johnson was obsessed with not being a failure, and not being seen as a failure, a fear he harbored since his youth. The fear was so great that he nearly hadn't run back in 1964, an election which turned out to be a landslide in his favor. Now he faced the prospect of being an incumbent once nominated by his party who failed to get the nomination a second time. It was a kind of humiliation no president had faced since Franklin Pierce back in 1856. Furthermore, one of his potential usurpers was Robert F. Kennedy, who'd just entered the race weeks before Johnson stepped out. Not only did Johnson despise Kennedy on a personal level, but it would be a repeat of what had happened eight years prior, when Johnson had lost the nomination to John Kennedy. Another possible reason was that Johnson was simply fed up with how he was perceived, as he believed the media had grossly and unjustly tarnished his image. He didn't think he was getting the proper credit for his domestic successes, as he saw the media unfairly obsessing over his lack of success in the Vietnam War. Johnson was greatly concerned with his image and legacy, and this kind of public perception was infuriating. Even if he somehow won another term, he'd likely still be struggling with how to resolve Vietnam. However, what was most likely the overriding reason for him declining a second term was his health. Despite being only 60, he had numerous mounting health problems. An actuarial study commissioned by Johnson predicted he wouldn't live past 64. The prediction ended up being true. Johnson died in 1973 on January 22nd, only two days after what would have been the end of his second term. Johnson lived the last few years of his life in retirement on his ranch. Had he won a second term, it's possible he would have died sooner due to the stress of the presidency. Subscribe to see more videos like this on United States Presidents. If you'd like to show your support for the channel and have your name featured in the credits, you can make a Patreon donation of either 2 5 or $15 a month. Patreon link in the description below.